Welcome to the Calvary Baltimore Weekly Sermon. Here's today's teaching. Uh, happy Lord's Day. Uh, while you're making your way, I'd like to draw your attention this morning to Psalm 23. We're never getting out. <laughs> Psalm 23. Our passage this morning picks up at verse 4, but we will begin our reading at verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, Psalm 23 is written in such a way that verse 4, specifically the beginning half is at the heart of the message. And in fact, you can apply, you could apply the themes of verse 4 literally to every other section of this psalm. So this is the heartbeat of Psalm 23, and I'm going to show this a little bit more to, in tomorrow's Bible study. Anyways, uh, let's read verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, let's pause this could be translated as deep shadow or the valley of deepest darkness. And boy, I can sympathize with that sometimes, can't you? <laughs> what David is describing, we don't have much of here in Maryland, but it's important to understand that so much of Psalm 23 is symbolic and he's drawing from symbols in shepherding. And in Israel, in the Holy Land, in the surrounding areas, at the bottom of certain valleys, winter streams have cut deep crevices in the rock. I don't know if anyone's ever seen uh, any archaeological stuff on the site at Petra. Uh, it's, there's this beautiful uh, city-looking thing built into the rock, but the journey to Petra is these long, narrow causeways in these deep gorges that are sometimes 50, 100 feet high that you have to walk through. And water, uh, can, when, it, when it rains, the water has cut these crevices in the rock and has made these pathways. And, and in fact, in, in 1957, um, uh, there was a bad, there was a, there, when, when it rains in these areas, it can rain quickly, it can rain a lot, but the problem is the ground's not porous, and so it goes down. <laughs> and so that area in Petra got flooded in an instant, and uh, 50 French tourists died just walking that tiny little path because it swept them away. It came so quickly. Uh, and, and such waters would have been known to shepherds like David. They were places of extreme uh, danger. You got to remember. Remember how experienced the fishermen were uh, in around the Sea of Galilee, and how often do we read in the Gospels that the fishermen get stuck in storms? You'd think they got to be terrible fishermen. No, when you're in Israel, you'll see every there's mountains and hills everywhere, and storms come up and over these mountains very quickly. And when you get to the more arid places, there's nowhere for the water to go but down these valleys. And so th storms can come quickly, and they can be very deadly uh, when they come. And fun fact, uh, just south of Jerusalem, there is a literal, they call it to this day, the Valley of Shadow of Death. Uh, it's five miles long, so if you're stuck in there, you're stuck. And it, it's no more than 12 feet wide at its largest point, and floodwaters have been marked as high as eight feet. So imagine you have a flock of sheep you're walking through there. They're not jumping or swimming above eight feet. And so these, were, these valleys were places of great danger. They were valleys that the shepherd moved us along quickly. Uh, and occasionally they would have to walk through. Then it goes on to say, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It is here that the psalm changes now. We're about to read from the third to the second person. So it's about to get much more intimate. It goes, for you are with me. Later it says, your rod and your staff, they come for me. Passing through the valley, the, the presence of the shepherd becomes more personal. I want you to see the intimacy grows as soon as they get to the valley. 
David again moves from the third person to the second person. I believe the reason David has done this is because the presence of God is never more evident than when we are helpless without him. When we finally run out of options, I mean, don't we by nature think we're so clever? (laughs) We can just figure life out on our own. No, you can't. (laughs) When we finally run out of our own personal resources, and yet as believers, we find ourselves, we're still pressing on and still following him. That is when we come to the reality of Emmanuel. Not that God's out there somewhere. No, he is with us. That you are God with me. That you, God, will preserve me and see me through for you are with me. It goes on to say, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. (laughs) Sheep. Sheep have a very special problem. They have little to no defenses <laughs> at all. Uh, now, it's a misnomer. Sheep can bite. And you're ne- they're never going to kill anything with that bite, however. It's just more of an annoyance. Uh, they have no claws, so they can't scratch you. Their best weapon is to headbutt. So they headbutt one another. But they will never headbutt themselves away from a wolf's attack. <laughs> They will only put their head in the wolf's mouth. That will never beat the wolf back. It'll never beat a bear back. And so the sheep's security, the sheep's defense, the defense of the flock is nothing that the sheep possesses. It's the shepherd. And here David speaks about not being in fear and being comforted because of the shepherd's rod and the shepherd's staff. Notice the head butts nowhere, nowhere in here. And I think this is incredibly insightful. First, the rod. The shepherd's rod was a two-foot mace. It's a blunt weapon, a club to kill predators. This is the same word for rod that David speaks of in Psalm chapter 2. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. I can't ever read that without thinking of Handel's Messiah. Uh, But anyway, so the, the, the sheep should be comforted By the weapons of God, our good shepherd. That if a wolf or a bear or a lion come to attack us and kill us and eat us, we could never headbutt our way out of that trouble. But the good news is we don't have to. Our good shepherd has a rod, a club, to beat our enemies back. You know, the Apostle Paul touches on this similarly in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, when he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. Paul then goes on to speak on thought life, but clearly the weapons of the church. What are your weapons? The weapons of the church, the weapons of God's people are not within ourselves, but is within the ability and the power of the triune God. The church will never, ever take the nations for Jesus Christ if we try to headbutt the nations. I love what Spurgeon says. How do you defend a lion? You let him out of his cage. We let God defend us. We let God use his weapons. (laughs) The weapons of our warfare is our shepherd. You will never be able, again, to headbutt your way to victory against Satan who's called what? A a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You're never going to headbutt your own way out of your vices. Me and Dr. Frank used to talk about this all the time. You want to overcome a sin? Stop fighting it. Ask God to fight it for you. Bring him in. It's the shepherd's rod. It's not your headbutt. And something I personally struggle with, you know, I believe, and I believe a lot of people are this way, whenever an obstacle presents itself... I don't know about you, but my first inclination is to immediately do something. Like, I'll handle it. And and sometimes there are things that do need a quick response, of course. But what what I need to learn better, and this is just me being really honest, is that I can't solve anything. (laughs) There is no problem I can solve outside of the provisions and the approval of God. And so when difficulties arise, where do we go? Do we default to the head button? Or do we default to the shepherd? We must learn to trust our shepherd. 
We must immediately go to God the Father. What are we told? To approach the throne of grace boldly and immediately and appeal to our shepherd as his sheep. And listen, there are 8 billion people on this planet. How many of them know the name of Jesus as their Savior? You belong to God Almighty. And as his sheep through faith, you have the distinguished honor of being near and dear to the Lord. And so you must call out to him. This is your birthright. God hears you. (laughs) And he will provide for you and he will protect you. And this is what the disciples marveled at in Luke 10, 17. It said, the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. In whose name? In your name. And I don't go down this road often, but very, uh, very often anyways, but as we think about demonology and the demonic, there are real, genuine evil forces in this world. Do you know that? And, and they all live in Washington, D.C. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm mostly kidding. There are people all over this world who literally, John 8, 44, are under demonic influence. That's real. I'm not finding a demon under every cup, but that's real. And you have absolutely no weapons against against them apart from your shepherd. And the shepherd has a rod. It's called a shevet. And David seems to be primarily comforted by the shepherd's rod because of its primary purpose. The primary purpose of the rod is to club the enemy. However, there is another use to this rod, and I wasn't going to share it, but I got so excited I wanted to anyways. Uh, It's in Leviticus 27, 32. I'll just read it for you. And every tithe of herd and flocks and every tenth of animal of all that passes under the herdsman shevet, rod, same word, shall be holy to the Lord. Here's what's really fascinating about the rod besides its ability to club the enemy. (laughs) When the shepherd returns home from an evening, so he's gotten them green grass, he's provided them still waters, he's walked them through the valley. When the shepherd at the end of the night gets his sheep back to his house, he takes that rod and he puts it over the wall of, uh, uh, of his property, over the entrance to the pen. And he does that because if you've ever seen sheep, they kind of mingle and hop all over. They're very impatient. I don't know if that rings a bell. And so they put a rod down so only one could pass through under the rod at the same time. And do you know why the shepherd does that? So he can count them. Every night he puts that rod over the sheep pen, and that's what he uses to make sure that he got every single member of his flock home. And it is there when he realizes if the count is off, I will leave the 99 and go pursue the one. This is what our Lord does. David takes so much comfort in the rod's ability to thwart the plans of the advance of the enemy, but he also takes comfort in the rod because the rod is the very thing that secures our number, that makes sure that we are part of God's elect, that we are counted in his sheepfold. Now, secondly, the staff. The staff, unlike the club, the staff is not a weapon, but a tool of the shepherd, the the, the, the staff helps the shepherd with great distances. It helps him walk on uneven terrain. But in relation to the sheep, the staff helps keep the flock in line. Now, the shepherd is not taking that long shepherd's crook and hitting the sheep with it. <laughs> That's not what he's doing. He uses that shepherd's crook as an extension of his arm. So uh, when, I, when it's time for me to, to get my kids to, to brush their teeth before bed, it's chaos And so I have to literally, like, show them the way like an airline attendant into the bathroom. (laughs) Come on, come on. He uses that rod as an extension of his arm to usher his sheep to where they need to go. Uh, and, and, And it comforts, it comforts the sheep to see the long arm of the Lord. How many times have you prayed, God, just tell me what you want me to do? Just show me what you, where you want me to go. And every once in a while, you see the end of that shepherd's crook, and you go, ah. And this, is, this gives David, the God's sheep, great comfort. 
And then finally, David says that the rod and the staff, it comforts him. David is comforted in all these things that God provides for his sheep. That's today's text. A few thoughts. Valleys. Psalm 23 is describing the journey of God's people, the Christian life. And I believe it's important for us to understand that in the gospel, when someone became a Christian, when someone became a believer in Jesus Christ, Jesus did not do what most churches do today and tell them, okay, you believe this, pray this special prayer. (laughs) He did not say after one of his teachings, whoever liked what I said, raise your hand or walk forward. (laughs) Because listen, do we want to hold to the traditions of man or do we want to be biblical? (laughs) Well, biblically, Jesus would say, follow me. When when there was a genuine convert, Jesus would say, follow me. And they would. And so biblically, if you want to be of Christ, you must follow Christ. And the same is true today. Psalm 23 is describing the life of a believer, of following Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. And here we are at the heart of Psalm 23, and it is absolutely essential that every single one of us must see this, that following the good shepherd does not mean a trialless life. This is one of my great pains. This is one of the great problems with not Pentecostalism, but hyper-Pentecostalism, and certainly the prosperity gospel, where the messaging is, if you have enough faith, you will thrive in every aspect of life. Have you heard this? You will have perpetual abundance. Pray for, the, for that new Corvette, and God will deliver it to you. Speak it into existence. Or worse, if you have enough faith, you'll no longer have illness or handicap, which leaves someone to believe I must not have enough faith when they're not healed. But as we see from Psalm 23, that is completely contrary to the scriptures. David is showing us that the blessed life of God's flock, though it is filled with green grass, though it is filled with still waters, though it walks the paths of righteousness, the paths of righteousness run through some very dark valleys. There is, loved ones, there is no greater blessing than belonging to the Lord. It is a life of purpose. It is a life of guidance, of peace. I woke up last night at four in the morning with something on my mind, and I just gave it to God. You know how awesome that is? (laughs) It's a life of eternity, community, forgiveness, grace, joy. You know how hard it is to let go of something that someone's done to you? Like you really just want to stick it to them. But then you give it to God, and you know what? It doesn't hurt anymore. These are the things the shepherd provides. But at the same time, this path can be very difficult. It can be very scary at times to follow the Lord. And understand, Christianity is not a karma-based religion. Very often, God's most precious saints spend large seasons in dark valleys, They have wayward children. Their spouses are difficult. Their finances are tight. They have health struggles. And why? If the arrangement is, God, if I pray enough and I'm faithful enough, you do X, Y, and Z, then God's violated the contract. But that's not the way this is. Why does God allow us to enter into these very dark valleys? Is it because he wants to see us squirm a little? (laughs) No. God leads us through these valleys because it's for the benefit of his sheep. This brings us to our second point, preciousness and confidence. Passing through these scary seasons, these dark valleys, not only 
We have to understand God not only is leading us somewhere, very specific, but it is in these moments that the preciousness of the shepherd becomes, or the presence of the shepherd becomes more precious to his people. Personally, I try not to get into my personal stuff too much, but I am going through something very difficult right now. But I can tell you, without any hesitation, my love for the Lord has grown exponentially through this trial. And you see, as believers, as God's sheep, we can have the confidence to know that when we enter into our valleys, the Lord will be with us. We have one of two options. We can either enter into the valley, because let me tell you, you're either going into a trial, in a trial, or coming out of a trial. Those are your three options. <laughs> and either we panic and try to run out of the trial the way we came in, away from the presence of God, or we draw near to the shepherd for strength. And this is why so many people, they come to a trial and they abandon God. Because God broke the contract in their mind. A contract that they made up. God never signed. <laughs> or we grow closer to him. And you'll see, someone very rarely stays the same when they've been through it. And this is why the paths of righteousness, the right paths, contain valleys of deeper darkness. Yes, because the paths run through those valleys, but God uses those valleys to instill confidence in us meaning a confidence in him. If I may use the analogy of Psalm 1 of a tree, uh, without trial, we would have absolutely no depth of soil, now would we? <laughs> and let's be honest, what if God gave you everything you'd ever wanted? You ever see Bruce Almighty where everyone's uh, won the lottery and they burned the city to the ground? <laughs> if God gave you everything you ever wanted from this moment on, you would have no desire to come to him. Right. And you would wake up in hell one day. <laughs> Think about it. Think about the times in your own life where you have gotten on your knees, the tears and the boogers are meeting somewhere. You just got that ugly cry going. <laughs> Think about the times you have poured your heart out to the Lord, where you have passionately sought the Lord. Were things going great? <laughs> were they going really smooth when that occurred? No, you were in the valley when you genuinely needed him. Our trials deepen our faith. Sadly, exponentially more than our victories, typically. Remember what Paul says in Romans 5, 3, we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Do you also see that our sufferings, our valleys of deeper darkness, produce endurance in us? When you've walked through one valley, you have more strength to walk your second valley. And when you've walked through your second valley you can now jog through your third valley. <laughs> and when you've jogged through your third valley, you can sprint through your fourth valley. Please hear me. If the Spirit of God is present, if the Spirit of God is present, these valleys do not hinder our Christian walk. They strengthen it. And not only does this valley strengthen us, it changes us. It instills a trust and a confidence in us. It produces hope in us. When Paul goes on to describe this hope, he connects it with God's love that has been poured into our hearts. A confidence and a hope in God, birthed after great trial, is directly connected with God's love for us and our love for him. And this is why, this is what David's getting at in Psalm 23. Though we walk through this life experiencing valleys, we will not fear. Why? For he's with us. We learn. We learn to grow, to love the shepherd through the trial. If the spirit of God is present, that trial is not destroying you, it's beautifying you. It's making you more like the father's own son. 
And we can know confidently, you can know confidently that the next trial you enter into, God is entering into it with you. And his love and his mercy will be there for you. This is what these trials produce, is steadfastness and endurance in who our Father is. Now thirdly, coffee break. <laughs> Pam got the memo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> thirdly, walk. Please notice that the Bible, the same God that wrote your DNA code is the same God who handcrafted this Bible. Might I add, he spent six days making all of this. He spent thousands of years crafting this. And please notice the detail of verse four. Even though I walk, y'all lack, through the valley of the shadow of death. I want you to notice that we lay down in green pastures and beside still waters, but we walk through the valleys. God does not lay his sheep down in the valleys. So please hear me. We do not remain in the valley. We walk through it. He walks us through it with us. A few years ago, when we were at the uh, Baltimore location, this church was, I remember one Sunday morning, does the Lord ever prompt your heart to go up to somebody? Um, Normally it's that line of the buffet. I see someone and they look like they're going to scoop me extra. (laughs) Actually, I was at a wedding here last Sunday. I saw Alex and Amber back there. Hi. Your your servers offered to give me double double chicken parm. And I go, she gets me. Uh, But... (laughs) Oh, food's never far from my brain, and I'm sorry about that. But I saw, I saw, we were at the Baltimore location. I saw, I saw an older woman. You know, you can just look at somebody you care for and know they're not doing good. Yeah. I just walked up to her. I didn't even have words. I just hugged her. Mm-hmm. And she sobbed on my chest. Oh. I mean, cried, cried. <laughs> and it's like, uh... <laughs> Yeah. I, to this day, I still don't know what was going on. Uh, uh, all I could think of to say was, it's just for a season. It's just for a season. Family, symbolically, of course, on every wall and every rock and every crevice, crevice in every valley of darkness is written the words just for a season. The good shepherd will never make his sheep lay down in the valley. He will see you through. <laughs> what does the New Testament tell us? He will neither leave you nor forsake you. And so please, please, please hear me. The inheritance of belonging to Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, means that your trials will not last forever. It's just for a season. Follow him and he will walk you through it because he's walking through the valley. (laughs) Now, fourthly, and our final point, keep walking. Even the most godly people, even the strongest people under great duress, under seasons of tremendous trial, There can be a great temptation for all of us, let's be honest, to lay down in the valley defeated. (laughs) You can feel so bad for so long, you assume that's just the way it is. Can't you? Can't you be mistreated for so long by certain people? You assume that's just the way it is. You can be so sad and anxious and depressed for so long, you assume that's just the way it is. 
And in those seasons of utter depletion, because there are times where you think you've hit rock bottom and then you dynamite that floor and you keep going. In those seasons of utter despair, we can be tempted to lay down in the valley. (laughs) But please hear me. Please, please, please. That is not of God. I want you to know that God loves you with an incomprehensible zeal. If the father was willing to butcher his own son, do you think he went through all of that to watch you writhe in misery for the rest of your life? That is not of God. And his desire is to not let you stay stuck in that misery, but to walk you through it. And into, as the psalm ends, spoiler alert, in the house of the Lord forever. And so if you're finding yourself laying down this morning or maybe future tempted to lie down, have you ever been content in being discontented before? That's a weird feeling. You find yourself defeated. I want you to know those thoughts do not come from the Lord. And I want to encourage you to get up and keep moving. Get up and keep moving. Satan wants you in the valley. God wants you to walk through it. So get up and get with your shepherd and keep moving. Because listen, what if the Lord, let me rephrase this. You know Jesus could return at any moment, like right now. We hear the trumpet, we all get sucked up. I'm probably slower because I weigh more. But we're, we're on our way up. If the Lord returns today, if you were to die tonight, then die with your hand to the plow. How many times in the gospel does he say when he returns, he wants to see us busy. He wants to see us faithfully serving, not laying in the valley. (laughs) Die working. Meet the Lord when you're working for the Lord. And the same is true. I mean, I I can't watch the news right now. It like just messes me up. It's terrible. And half And all of them are lying. I don't know it's true, but it's just I see dead bodies here, dead kids here, buildings. It's all terrible. And then I look at our country and I see what's happening and people are getting beat up on the streets for pumping gas and the people in the White House are filled with a gaggle of demons or whatever. And it's like, I can't watch the news. And we can default to despair, can we not? But isn't it true that one move of the Spirit of God and it could all change in a day? And what if the Lord returns? Does he want us throwing our hands up and saying, I can't fix it, it's too broken? Or do we want to have our hand to the plow when he returns and trying to save our neighbors and loving our families and spreading the gospel to our coworkers? Because that's America, it's the people. We must invest in the lives of the people And even our most difficult people, how many times does our Lord say he had great compassion on them? Yeah, I I went and got coffee this morning and I saw all these families getting coffee and they're on their way to sports or on their way to this and I just was so sad. It's like they're lost. They need the Lord. Am I to quit? No. We are to put our hand to the plow. And the day that you meet the Lord, may you still be pursuing him and working for him and sowing seeds and loving his people to press on, Philippians 3.14 says, press on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Remember what our Lord told us in Matthew 7.13, enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. It is the easiest thing in the world to go to hell. You know what you have to do? Nothing. Coast on. And those who enter by it are many. 
For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who even find it are few. Yes, the paths of righteousness are hard, but dear God, don't quit. You will be in the presence of the Lord before you know it. Time moves so fast. And the older I get, it seems like a cruel joke, the faster it moves. (laughs) Don't throw it away. Don't throw your inheritance away. Press on. You know, our dear brother Rob is in hospice right now. And my parents went to visit him earlier this week. And they asked him a few days ago. My mom said, do you have any words for us? Essentially, you know, hey, you're about to step into eternity. What do you, what do you got to tell us? It's so close to glory. And he paused for a second and he said, stay the course. Stay the course. He's exactly right. <laughs> it is the Lord's path. That is the only path that leads to the house of the Lord. Salvation is only found through faith in Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. And so stay the course. Press on, get up, and run your race. Anything else is demonic. Keep moving forward. So I want to encourage you this morning, uh, before we go, I want to read with a scripture a scripture to you from Psalm 46. God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy inhabitation of the Most High God. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage and the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress forever. Selah. Let's pray. We love you, God. (laughs) We love you. But we do not love you as we ought. So increase our love of thee. And God, we pray for both sides of your ministry where you make us lie down and be still in times where you walk us. I pray a special prayer this morning that those who are beside green grass and still waters that you teach them to be still and rest in thee. I love what Augustine says, our soul is most satisfied as we are satisfied in thee. Help us to be utterly satisfied when you have provided all things for us. Teach us to not want. And God, when we find ourselves in these valleys, we pray that you remind us to keep walking. Do not let us lay down in despair. Do not let us grieve as if we have no hope. For we do have hope, and it is in you, our Lord. And so please strengthen us down to our bones this morning. Be with our brains and our organs, our heart and our lungs, God, please. Let us give you absolute glory for absolutely everything. We pray for anyone here that does not know you that they may not raise their hand or walk forward, but choose from this day forth to follow you. Let them follow the good shepherd. We love you, God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your people. We pray for anyone here who needs special prayer that go receive it by our uh, prayer team off by the side here. And God, please, please, please change us today for your glory. Put zeal in our hearts and love. And in Jesus' name, all of God's people said, 
Amen. Let's stand and worship. That's today's message from Calvary Baltimore. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to know more about us, visit calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Our email address is calvarybaltimore1 at gmail.com. To financially support the work God is doing through Calvary Baltimore, go to calvarychapelbaltimore.org and click Give. And if you're in the area, stop by on a Sunday morning. For directions and service times, go to our website at calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Live streams and weekly sermons are available on our website, our Facebook page, and YouTube. You can also watch with our mobile app and on Apple TV and Roku. Search for Calvary Chapel Baltimore on these platforms for instant access to great Bible teaching and encouragement. We hope you've been blessed by this week's teaching. Until next time, as Pastor Josh says, study the Word to live the Word to share the Word. And join us again for the next Calvary Baltimore Weekly Sermon.